Good afternoon. My name's Pete Wool, and I am a police officer in Pocatello, Idaho. That's how I support my steelhead fishing habit. Uh, I'd much rather, much rather spend the time on the river than most of the places I go. Uh, what I have found in about the last five years are tube flies. That doesn't mean that tube flies are any new discovery. They've been around in several other countries, uh, Northern Europe, Scandinavia, those fly fishermen there have been using tube flies forever. They really took off in popularity in the UK and the United States during and after the period immediately following World War II. Uh, scarcity materials, the, the dissolution of the British Empire and their inability to have access to the exotic materials they'd had for traditional fly, fly tying prior to that was now gone so they turned more to tubes. Tube flies are great. They have so many advantages. Uh, one of the things is the added durability of a tube versus a traditional tied fly. Uh, there's a piece of silicone tubing that I'll put on the back at the, upon completion of this fly where the tube actually sit, or pardon me, the hook actually sits inside the tube. It's a small short shanked hook with a wide gap I personally prefer Daiichi 510 X-point hooks. They're extremely sharp. I use size 6s, size 8s, depending on the size of the fly I'm tying. Uh, you can change those and make them as versatile as you need in order to suit the water and the fish that you're fishing for. The nice thing about tube flies is, again, the durability because the hook will separate from the junction tubing and the fly will slide up the leader, staying away from the teeth. Steelhead are also notorious for banging their head, dragging their head along the bottom, trying to shake the fly. They have a tremendous survival instinct. Makes it all that much more difficult to catch them, and it makes it very, very hard on a, on a traditionally tied fly. The huge, sharp teeth they have, sever, hack, sever hackles, will shred floss bodies on, on difficult tied flies. However, on a tube, it slides up the leader, it's out of the way of that. And another great thing about them is you will land more of the fish you hook on tube flies simply because you take away one of the fish's greatest advantage being leverage. If I could give you an analogy, if you were given an order or your life depended on getting a nail out of a board, would you rather be handed up? pry bar to get the nail out or someone giving you a dull spoon to dig it out. Obviously you'd use the pry bar. It's the same thing for your fly, only we have the advantage of using the spoon because we're using that short shanked wide gapped hook that hooks much better and takes away that leverage advantage from these big strong hardy fish who can shred lines and everything else anyone who's fished with steelhead for steelhead any time at all, I don't have to explain that to you. And so if you're interested, I'd like to demonstrate this fly for you, the versatility of a tube fly. This is based on a pattern from the pros who tie for the Humer company, E-U-M-E-R. You can go to humer.com and they have a, a tube fly classroom and they'll demonstrate all types and levels of patterns. They have easy, moderate, and advanced patterns. Uh, this particular pattern comes from the advanced, but it, it's not hugely difficult to tie, more so because of the number of steps in, in the fly. And it's a very fishable fly, but it's also a very attractive fly. And by spending a little bit more time on it and adding additional materials to it, be suitable to give to someone as a, as a gift. Earlier today, I tied one for a friend of mine and started out saying, oh, put anything on there that's going to catch fish to that fly is never going to get close to the water. It's going on my wall, and I'm not, not a, incredibly talented tire like some of the other people. Other people are, but that's the. Things you can do with tube flies. That's how adaptable they are. So. What I've done to begin with is, placed, a piece of, medium-sized humor. Line or pardon me, liner tubing inside, or pardon me, extra small liner tubing inside a piece of medium flexible plastic tubing. And then I've, what they describe as married them together. And that's simply saying I build a thread base 
to form the joint between the two and then coated that with super glue, Zappa Gap, whatever you have. It adds, makes it much more durable. And once they're together in that combination, as you'll notice, the traditional problem with tying tube flies isn't near the problem. And that is, as I torque back and forth on this, it doesn't twist on the mandrel and you don't have the problem with the fly sliding. You can get it, you can get it to slide and you can get it to twist and I may even do it for you during this demonstration, but the likelihood of it happening is greatly reduced by, by marrying these tubes together and using the super glue. So as with any fly, you just start with a fly base. We're gonna leave that space to tie in the tail and also to join the junction tubing. So just a simple, typical start, just because it's a tube fly, it's nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. What we'll do first is add a tail to it. This is Arctic Fox body fur. As you can see, it's extremely supple, it's very susceptible to any air currents and wind, so you can imagine the movement you would get from this fly in once it's in the water and moving cross current on a swing situation. I have a friend who's a graduate of Montana State University whose colors are blue and gold, so we'll be following that, that color pattern for this. Not that it wouldn't be an effective fishing color as well, eliciting a, a reactive strike from a steelhead rather than a feeding instinct from an anadromous, or pardon me, not anadromous, but from, from a landlocked fish. But in honor of him and the efforts he put in to graduate and get his master's degree, this will be a blue and gold version of the humor pattern known as a steelhead killer. So we take a average sized clump of Arctic fox body fur, cut it as with any mammal fur or hair. There are guard hairs, you want to remove as many of those as possible what that does, it helps accentuate that movement once it's in the water. Common problem with tying with any fur, static electricity. The easiest way to tame that is just with a small amount of saliva, rub it on the fur. Tail placement is typical. There will be a junction tubing out to approximately this point, so we're going to come with the main body of the tail, not just the guard hairs, being right at the where that junction would be. So from the main tube on the fly, talking about a half inch or so. Tie it in. The best way to do it is using what's called a soft loop technique. It's coming over lightly from the top and cinching from the bottom. Helps prevent the hair from rolling on the tube. A couple of wraps to secure it and remove the excess. Now we'll just move a Montana State blue thread ahead to that marriage point. And we're ready for our next material. Next material will be a ribbing. The rib will not only give the body a segmented appearance, but it'll also be used to secure the body hackle once we reach that point. Kind of a throwback to tying the more traditional and classic steel head patterns is to start with any of your materials that are going to be present in the body should be initiated at the very front of the fly and you want to continue those all the way to the back so that you keep a uniformity in your body. And not to anger any of you Grizzly fans, but now we have some Montana State University blue floss. Our next material. Trim that off. And now we'll begin the process of building up the body. And we start work front to back, and then we'll reverse and work back to front. I found it more 
efficient to put the floss on a bobbin because I do actual fishing. Don't just read about it. <laughs> My hands get so rough to the point where they snag on the fibers in the floss. I'm even having a problem with what's leading into the bobbin. So I found by putting it on a bobbin, it keeps it out of my fingers, keeps the floss tamed down a little bit more, and makes it somewhat easier to wrap onto the fly. If you have a problem with the floss strand separating, if you give it a few twists and keep your wraps a little closer together, it'll alleviate that problem that's common with tying a floss body. They're very very attractive, very compact bodies. I personally like floss bodies on my steelhead flies. I've seen dub bodies that are beautiful, done by persons that are tremendously talented with being able to dub flies. My personal preference is floss, but any material that you feel is appropriate or you've had success with is obviously transferable to this fly. Now we've reached the back. I'm going to wrap back forward. The floss should lay fat, flat enough that you're not going to actually be able to see where your previous wrap was. Just continuing an orderly even wrap all the way back to the front. If you get errant threads sticking out, that won't be a problem. The, hack, the body hackle of the fly will lay a lot of those down. If it's a problem with getting caught in your other threads, and by all means, feel free to use your scissors or whatever tool you have at your disposal to trim the threads away. And we're just about back to the front of the fly. And we have the body ribbing material covered now. I'll reverse the thread back. Just standard tie off. There's nothing because it's a tube fly, it's not that much difference in standard fly tying techniques. Trim that off and release the floss. Now we're ready for the next point. So, this is what the body would look like if you're concerned about, about ridges. You can burnish this, you can use any rounded metal surface the edge of a bodkin you can use to move back and forth and actually burnish it and it'll flatten out quite a bit of the lumps in there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. That would be a matter of personal preference. Now we'll want to dub in a body. Obviously the fly needs a body, but it also serves as a base on the hook to assist in building the wings on this fly and to make sure that the wings and the, and the subsequent hackle don't collapse in the water column and make your fly silhouette that much smaller, difficult for the fish to see. So use standard dubbing techniques, any material that you care to use, any color combination that works. There's nothing that's going to be deemed inappropriate in this type of fly tying. It has some blue dubbing. Standard dubbing techniques that we all learned is fly tires. We'll begin building up the body on the fly. Don't be afraid to get your hands involved in your fly tying. These aren't so delicate to a point that you can't get your fingers in and assist your fly tying. And that was a difficult thing for me to overcome when I first started fly tying. I thought, oh my gosh, if I get my fingers close to that fly, it's going to ruin it. And I did ruin it because I didn't control my materials well enough. So I assume everybody probably more experienced as a fly tire than I am and, is and has been through those problems before and knows what I'm talking about. If you don't 
getting it right in there with your fly. The more control you can exert over your materials, the better your fly will turn out. So we're not building up a huge body. We're not going to use all of that available space on the tube for the body. Again, we just want a built up body to help keep the wings and the hackle from collapsing in the water column. So just a bit more and we'll be ready to place our body hackle on the fly. Tube flies are extremely versatile as well. I devoted the majority of my fishing time now to steelhead fishing, but they're incredibly popular with landlocked trout fishermen, pike fishermen, saltwater fishermen. They're starting to use a lot for smallmouth bass and similar fish, offshore fish. So you can adapt them to whatever you're fishing for. So that's a completion of the dubbing step for the body. You can adjust the size of your body. The classic steelhead killer would actually begin with a body approximately at this point in the fly, taking up well, about half of the main tube on the fly out to the edge here. I personally like the longer bodies in the fly, so this one has the shorter body and more of the lower end floss body present in the fly. Next step is just a yellow saddle hackle. I like to choose feathers from the middle of a strung patch because of where they're removed from the bird's neck. And the, the feathers I look for are the ones with the more webby hackle towards the bottom, but they still have enough stiff fibers towards the end to build up the appropriate body hackle through the lower portion of your fly. So once you've chosen your feather, you cut it or pull it from the patch. Is it typical with any type of a hackle? The portion you don't want to use is the fuzzier portion up here. Move down towards the clean barbs on the feather. Strip them away from the stem to prepare them for tying in. I don't mean to be incredibly low level to persons with more fly tying experience, but I don't mind catering to those peep persons who don't have a tremendous amount of experience either. Start with a hackle on the back side, every feather having two sides, a front and a back. The front being convex, curved towards the top, the other side being convex, like a magnifying mirror. So face the back towards you, tie the stem of the hackle in at the very beginning of the body, secure it well enough, and keep in mind that you're going to be pulling on this as you wrap, and again, this is a tube fly, and one of the inherent difficulties in tying fly, tube flies is that they will spin if you pull them off of the base on the mandrel. So keeping that in mind, don't want to get too terribly radical with pulling and twisting on the fly. You should have trimmed the hackle down low enough to a point where the stem, right down the middle, is not so stiff that you can't wrap it. Pull it back towards you, push the hackle down towards the stem, and then fold the hackle towards the back, just like I'm doing with my thumb and forefinger. We want to take a couple of wraps at the front, one, each one being exactly in front of the other, pardon me, exactly behind the other one in this case. Now once we reach this point, we're going to begin hackling back towards the back in a palmer technique. Just a simple back wrap. Again, don't be afraid to get your hands on your fly. Maybe it was somewhat difficult to see, but I think it's pretty evident by the way 
I'm manipulating this fly that there's nothing wrong with getting your fingers in and getting them on the materials. Once you've brought the hackle back to this position, now we're going to take the rib that we tied in underneath the body and we're going to begin bringing it forward, countering the wraps we made just previously. The other, these other wraps were made away from us and back over the fly. These wraps will go the opposite way to counter rib and wrap that body hackle to secure it. When you're at this point, it's secured at the top. Here's your tag end of your body wrap. Place your finger on it and hold it in that position. As you wrap, manipulate the body or the ribbing material, pardon me, side to side and work it between the barbs on the hackle so that you're, you're not tying down all your hackle as you move forward. Once you have a couple of wraps you can release, continue to manipulate that body material back and forth. Keep as many of those barbs on your, on your body hackle out from underneath the rib as you possibly can. Use your, any sharp instrument, tip of your scissors or a bodkin or needle tool to help pull them out. Again, simply moving that ribbing material back and forth is going to greatly assist in separating those hackles. Coming towards the end of the body that we've started, Bring it forward, come around with your rib material at least once, pull up as you're pulling down, prevent that twisting motion on the mandrel with the tube, and tie it off as you would any other material. Trim off your excess. Don't cut your thread. Take your fingers and manipulate those fibers, the barbs on the feather, back towards the tail. Time off, back wrap, go towards the back of the fly, and you can see it gives it a more conical appearance and helps move those fibers back out of the way. Here we're going to place our first wing on the fly. We use the Arctic Fox material that we talked about earlier. If you use a zonker strip of, with Arctic Fox body fur on it, check both ends, find where the fewest number of the insulating hairs are at the bottom and where the, also where the hairs are the longest. So on this particular zonker strip, it would come, this is the end I'd want to use. It's fairly heavy with guard hairs, but you can take any stiff cone material, stiff cone tool and just brush that guard hair out and it should be somewhat out of sight for the camera. And if you can't find a brush, the next easiest thing to do be to clamp down on the tip ends of the hair and simply stroke it back. And each time you stroke, it's very obvious that those insulating hairs are coming in out from the fly. Get as many of them out as possible. The reason for that is not that they're bad or inappropriate hairs for fly tying. It just makes a, a larger tie-in point, makes it that much more difficult to complete the next steps, steps of the fly. So we have our first wing that's approximately the length of the palmered hackle on the body. Again, we'll just tame it down a little bit, pull out any loose or errant hairs. Goes right on top and would secure in just like a hair wing on any other fly. Again, if you use that soft loop technique, I'm easy on the top, and then place your pressure on the bottom as you come up, you'll prevent the hairs from spinning around the body of the fly. It's not like spinning deer hair. We want a nice uniform flow. You can see how the body hackle and also how the dub body is keep assisting in keeping this wing upright and not folding it back over the hackle at that point. 
So now we want to start adding our tractors to the fly. and We'll use flash material for that. There are several good products out there. Some of the more unique products that are coming out are flash materials that are treated with a chemical or a substance that enhances their ability to refract ultraviolet light. And although they may not be terribly evident on camera and may look like typical flash material, once they're in the sunlight, becomes very evident how enhanced the colors and the reflectivity of the patterns are. And with steelhead fishing, same with in salmon fishing, being seen is everything. And every advantage we can give ourselves helps us that much more. Four to six strands of flash, we're not trying to create a fly a flash material, we're just trying to enhance. If you'll come underneath, capture your thread, and then pull it up on top of the fly, you can position this flash material wherever you need it. Secure it. Remove your excess. And then my preference is to cut these to varying lengths. I'll cut some outside of the wing and some inside just to give it a little different look. The next material we can add on here is an angel hair material and it just builds up another layer and gives a little bit of separation to the fly instead of simply being a typical hair and hackle wing. So I'll choose a to make the fly a little bit darker as well. This material is called angel hair. It's a very interesting material. It has short and long fibers. The fibers that we're interested in for the purpose of this fly are the longer ones. So while it may seem wasteful, it's really not because the only way to ensure you get the hairs, the length, and the size of your bundle enough is to cut it long. As you watch, I'll pull on the bottom and just like with the insulating hair, you can see how many fibers pull out. And these short fibers don't help. Once again, the same thing with the insulating hairs. All they do is make a bigger tie-in point. We don't want that in this fly at this time. Don't be afraid to pull loose hairs out of the end. Tame it down the same way, a little bit of saliva to break that static electricity. And each wing will be slightly longer than the one in front. So that's the approximate measuring point. Secure. And you can see the accent that that adds. We're not trying to create a wing of this. We're just trying to accentuate the other wing and give a little bit of division between the hair wings. Remove your excess. Our next wing comes in at this point. We'll be using the same material again. We'll be using a yellow Arctic Fox, the same color as this is a body material again, the same color as we use for the tail. And we'll have all the same. This wing will be slightly longer and slightly heavier than the previous wing. When I say heavier, I mean in volume of hair that we use. So there's the clump as it's been removed from the the skin, the tan skin of the animal. We'll go to the base. Begin removing the insulating hairs. So I'm going to be trying to head off the problem by wetting my fingers slightly ahead of time. Work these, work your left thumb or if you're right-handed, your opposite thumb and forefinger. Keep moving towards the back because these insulating hairs are also different lengths and that will release your grip on, your, on them and help you pull them free from your, your hair bundle. Tame this down, move the fibers. I prefer to start 
with a bit more even base. So I'll move my thumb and forefinger down and trim my bundle so I have a good flat tie-in point so I can see where it needs to lay. Lay it on top, get our measurement. It's where we need to be. It is slightly longer than the other base. Same technique, soft loop, easy coming on the top and snug it from below. A couple of wraps to secure. Be mindful of not building too big a base on this. It's easy to get a little overzealous with tying down these fibers and you typically you can very easily end up with a uh, almost a finished head sized pile of wrapping of tying thread that you'll have to over try and overcome in your next wing. Now we're going to put in a hackle for this. I've heard it pronounced so many different ways. I just call it schlappen. I've heard schlappen, schlappen. I think a good way to describe it is a webby, soft chicken feather. And again, on these not having access to a full neck, not really sure what the point would be on that. I'll choose one from the middle. You're looking for these webby, soft, very soft fibers in the middle. And if you'll notice, compared to the body hackle that we used that was very heavily stemmed quite a bit further up the actual feather, this one gets very fine at a much lower point and is very much easier to wrap in and separate from. So once you've chosen your feather, remove that from the strung clump strip away the unwanted portion and the exact same method as used before. Your tie-in point will be at the base of your previous wing. I'm going to remind myself that I'm going to be twisting and pulling on this so I'm going to make sure that's well secured before I begin doing that. Remove that little bit of stem. I don't want to pull this from underneath towards me. Make sure you come in front of the other hackle, the body hackle. Twist it if I can to get that feather facing the right way. Sometimes it's easier just to realize maybe I should reverse that. And that's exactly what I'll do to get the proper wrap on it rather than try and fight it through the entire wrapping process and twist each one. back with a secure tie-in point and make sure that thread's far enough ahead so that each wrap is directly in front of the previous one. And like when we were palmering the body hackle and wanted to move away behind the other one. Brush the fibers down towards the fly. Wrap. Put a three to four wraps around depending on your preference, how you want the fly to look. If we could get the opinion from the fish, we'd all be perfect fly tires. This is a pretty webby and long hackled piece of schlappen or one with long barbs. Actually capture part of the wing. Make sure that moves back up to the top. And it off, trim your excess, and the same process as with the body hackle. Back wrap towards it. 
capture as many of those barbs as you can. You can always come back and trim your excess. I'll even use a small brush and brush the fibers back, get them to stand up, obtain the static electricity. This is a, once again, this is a presentation type fly. This is not, not something that I would expect someone to go out and fish with, but it most certainly the colors would lend itself well to winter steelhead fishing situations. To finish this fly, I like to add something a little bit stiffer than a, a schlappen or even a, a regular saddle hackle. If you don't ac have access to guinea fowl or anything like that, or a stiffer hackle that you'd you normally use. You can certainly adapt any material, any type of a stiff hackled feather to finish your fly. It's not, it's not critical. It's all personal preference and choice. And from the time we started working on this fly, I think it's been fairly evident that it'll, it's gone back and forth between what looks is going to be a light colored fly and then a more darker colored fly. I like to finish up with something that's a little bit more contrasting. So we're going to go to a darker colored flash material. Again, the same, same technique to place it, secure it, and trim your excess. And just as before, we're going to vary the lengths on the material with a few, don't be afraid to let a few of them protrude past the end of the fly. We're going to build our thread head now. There's some errant fiber sticking out here. Trim those off rather than try and cover them with thread. That's where you can become a bit heavy handed with the thread. Ruin the profile of your fly. I prefer to work back and forth and then my final wraps will all be towards the front of the fly and finish with a head about that diameter on your fly. In fly fishing you don't want extremely bulky heads. We're still looking for a, a tapered head. What we've been able to achieve with this fly, tie it off and finish it as with any other fly, if you have the dexterity to be able to knot your own flies without using a tool, by all means, I feel a bit more comfortable just using a standard whip finisher. And then for additional durability, return to the super glue. We're finished with the tying portion of, the of a tube fly at this point, however the, the tube fly itself is not finished. The tube being the shape that it is, it would be possible even with the super glue under the right circumstances for the materials to move forward and actually slide off the end of the fly. The easiest way and the most common way to prevent that is to use an open flame source, a match, a butane match, or pardon me, a lighter or a butane match, something of that nature, and invert the fly. And use the blue part of the flame and just lower it towards the fly. And as you do that, you notice the fly is sealed because that tube Mushrooms back, expands, and all of that material is locked on the fly. Once that's been tied, 
or pardon me, it's been melted. I'll slide it back onto the mandrel. That'll open up the tube and allow the leader to pass more easily through the fly. And we used a lot of, lot of materials, mentioned the schlappen, mentioned the Arctic Fox, and I'll show you what the advantage is to using those materials, again, that are so susceptible to movement, air currents while you're tying, obviously, but also the currents in the water. This is the movement that you achieve. And you can imagine how that would translate to a heavier water current. And that's, that's a completion of this fly. Whatever colors you care to use, whatever materials you, you choose to use, as long as they're conducive to what your fishing conditions are, Fish them with confidence and have a good time, and this fly will last considerably longer than a conventionally tied fly because they are so much durable. Thank you.